Welcome back. This is Andy, and you're listening to the Poor Proles Almanac. This is our first interview of our B series, and it's probably going to be like most things we cover, completely different than if you've heard about this content conventionally. In this episode, we're joined by Dr. Torben Schiffer, and we're talking about wild honeybees and what they can tell us about the honeybees we have in our backyard. What limitations do honeybees naturally put on themselves, and are we actually listening to the bees? Torben's the author of a number of books and studies and focuses primarily on wild honeybees. His insight into their practices are invaluable, and I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. To get a hold of any of Torben's books or to listen to some of his presentations, links will be in the show notes. Before we get to the interview, I'd like to ask folks listening to take a moment, hit pause on your podcast streaming service, and if you can, give us a review. Reviews help the algorithms recommend our podcast to new listeners and are a primary tool for advertising to new guests why they should come and chat with us on the show. So every review counts. With that done, let's hop into this extremely interesting conversation. Torben, thanks so much for uh, taking some time to chat a little bit about this podcast. The Poor Pearls Almanac has been basically a project to look at the way we're growing food and the fact that we all know the way we're growing food today isn't sustainable, right? Whether it's the way we're sourcing chemicals, the destruction of the soils, uh, climate change, there's innumerable reasons why we can't continue to grow food the way we are today. Right. That's not just about food, but also our pollinators. The pressures going on native pollinators is incredible right now between, again, climate change, the way we're growing our food, the pesticides, just general destruction from suburbanization and so on. And then trying to figure out where something like a honeybee, which is not quite domestic and not quite wild, where does that fit into the system where they've become part of our commodity of food systems, right? Where we're, we're trucking them around the country. Yeah, it, It's a very complicated mess that we've gotten ourselves in over uh, a number of generations of poor management. And basically what we're trying to do is step back and say, what are we doing wrong? What should we be doing? And how do we get there? And it's not just about being more ethical with the bees themselves and how we manage them, but uh, within a bigger context, right? Within a bigger food system, within a bigger ecosystem. Yeah. And that's a really complicated and nuanced question, but we have to start somewhere. And that's, that's what I feel like we're kind of doing right now. Uh, a lot of people are coming to the same consensus. I know you are. Uh, and you've had some really interesting research uh, that you, you've been working on, and I'd love to chat a little bit about that with you. So for folks that aren't familiar with you, could you introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Torben Schiffer, and I have been working on wild living honeybee colonies, which are um, supposed to have extinct here in Europe or in Germany, but they they aren't. So and I did my research for Professor Jürgen Tautz. He is a kind of icon uh, when it comes to honeybees here in Germany or in Europe. And uh, he hired me because he kind of saw some of my research on the television in a documentary. And then he gave me a phone call and asked me to work for him. And I did. And uh, during that period where I was working for him for four years for the University of Würzburg, I was doing my research on wild living colonies in Germany. And I found out that... At the beginning of that research, you know, I I was just a little bit worried that I wouldn't find any wild living colonies because they were supposed to have extinct. Then for the first wild colonies, I drove like almost 800 kilometers uh, to do research on. And now I know they are in literally any forest that I can find them in any forest. And uh, that was very interesting because my, you know, my my scientific research field was to do research on the biology of colonies in the wilderness, in tree cavities, and compare them with the living conditions in boxes and managed hives, and point out if or whether there are any side effects, and uh, just learn about it. So, and uh, yeah, I could point out that there are indeed a lot of side effects. And uh, I could then figure out that literally any side effects that we are tackling is it the raw mites? Is it the foul brood? Is it, you know, all the diseases? It's literally 
fighting the symptoms of our own established husbandry system, which is uh, not really old. You know, the, the fact that we are keeping bees in boxes throughout my whole lifetime doesn't mean a thing, because if you ask my grandfather, who has passed away last year, he uh, his father, for, for instance, has been doing beekeeping in straw hives, and he had been doing beekeeping or was doing beekeeping in straw hives. And, you know, the whole thing conveyed right up to the Second World War. And because, you know, before the Second World War, uh, you couldn't keep bees in such densities as we're doing it today because we didn't have any industrialized sugar production that we can feed those bees. So we had to be in balance with the natural resources. You couldn't put more bees in, you know, in cities or certain locations and just you know ignore the 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 balances of natural resources so we had to live with the resources and we couldn't take more out of the system than it was you know out there and today it's a totally different story so after the second world war we had the industrialization 2.0 which means uh we were just 2.3 billion people after the second world war now we are up to 8 billion people and in the last decades we have lived in the in in the thought of or in in the you know mind of that the natural resources are unlimited at least until i was born in the 70s so in the 80s there was nothing like sustainability discussions or something like that so it was all like uh bigger wider more and you know get the most out of it and you know in that in that perspective, we have conveyed that to the bees as well after the Second World War, because then we learned how to manipulate them, how to get more out of the bees, how to compensate the side effects of that husbandry system, how to uh, adjust or how to compensate uh, with sugar feeding and then, you know, ignore the natural balances. It's it's very much, it's it's a very close analogy to industrial agriculture, really. Now we can tell that quite a few scientific research articles have appeared, uh, a few dozens that I know of uh, internationally that point out very clearly that, you know, the density of honeybee farming is now um, putting the food out of the mouths of other species, basically dragging them into extinction. Because what is happening in industrialized uh, countries like Germany is that most of the country side is agriculture. And so all the, all this, you know, the, the hundreds of species that our ecosystems are depending on have no place to, to, to thrive or to, to live there anymore because of that agriculture. So they have gone into the cities or the cities are the last resorts of no pesticides being used and so on. And now the cities are kind of being drawn by modern beekeeping and by the hype of beekeeping because it is, um, you know, the story is being told that everyone who is setting up a beehive in a box in the city is doing that for sustainability and is helping the bees. And, you know, it's it's a fairy tale. And it's it's not only a fairy tale, it's, it's the last untold catastrophe uh, in the second, in, in the 21st century. That is the biggest scandal to me that throughout the whole Western world, the, the narrative is being told to the people who most of them, most of the beekeepers that I know, most of the people who start beekeeping have good intentions. So these people are idealistic people. They really want to do good to nature and the bees. And then they end up uh, learning uh, a an, an industrial mass husbandry system, which is based on medication and compensation and which has a very huge impact on the whole environment. And it's very easy to understand, but it's being ignored by the lobby because that's where the money goes, right? Yeah. It, you know, you, you've brought up a bunch of different points that I think are really important to talk about, right? Or, yeah. First, you're, you've brought up this idea of like wild honeybees and how that compares to, and again, I kind of alluded to it before, this idea of domesticated honeybees, because they're not really domesticated, but they're also not completely wild either. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, you know, we have the issue of like here in the United States where honeybees are non-native in the first place. Yeah. So that adds another layer of complexity to it. And you've talked about the fact that like, if we think about these ecological systems, our agriculture, 
we don't do a good job of fully accounting for the externalities of our ecology, or our agricultural system, right? So the same way here in the United States in particular, we don't account for the cost of things like fuel pollution, right? We drive cars, gas right now is three fifty a gallon, which is very cheap compared to where you are, because we're not fully accounting for the true ecological destruction being done by using gas. Right. And, um, you know, obviously even that's still flawed, but the point being, as you brought up our drive to have, um, a safe food system that we never have shortages has decimated our ecological, uh, framework, which ultimately is what supports. And we don't think about how it supports that agricultural system. And it's just a really messy convoluted situation. And then you're adding well-meaning people that don't know a whole lot about ecology or insects saying, I'm going to have bees because this is something that's good for my tomato plants or whatever it might be. Right. So I'm, I'm really interested. You, you alluded to the fact that it, a lot has changed when it comes to the wild honeybees in Europe. And I know they've been, they're much more common to be wild there compared to here. They generally don't survive very long here. So what do you think is driving the fact that they are, or you're finding them more? Are there, are there more or are you just better at finding them? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that there is any difference, to be honest, because if you look at Thomas Seeley's research, and uh, Tom, Thomas Dyer Seeley is one of the biggest researchers in the world when it comes to uh, wild living honeybees, and he's done his studies in the United States. So, and he has uh, figured out that even with the raw raw mite, which is, you know, for beekeeping enemy number one, you know, the, the wild living Bees in the Arnold Forest, for instance, in the United States, don't have a problem, right? They have adapted ad adapted to uh, that, you know, parasite, and uh, they've gone through a bottleneck. So that was a, a kind of um, selectional process there. And he had samples of the genetic lines that were living in that forest before the varroa mite came and afterwards. So you could tell that, you know, some of these. Genetic lines have died out afterwards, but uh, the bees who are now living in the Yana forest, they do have aromas, they don't have any problem with it. And they have changed not only genetically a little bit, but they have, first of all, they have adapted within a few years, which is tremendously fast. And that's what you you would always have to expect or what you could always see if you, if you as a human being just, uh, Wendy Barrel once said, you don't know anything before you stop doing anything and see what nature would be doing. So it's, you know, that was a statement like that. And it's, if you look at, as a biologist, if you look at uh, evolution and natural selection, natural selection is evolution itself. So without selection, there is no evolution, right? So, and it's all based on a very simple principle that a parental generation generates more offspring than it is needed to sustain the population. And then the selectional phase comes and mother nature selects out of that mass an adapted class. That is the engine of evolution and adaption. So if we hinder that based on, you know, medication or just, uh, you know, interventions or manipulations, then there is no evolution anymore. And uh, this is what we see. We're using bees as a tool. It is a tool of industrialized agriculture, but that's not what the species is here for. And that is not how the ecosystems were, have been working like in the last millions of years. And so we are, you know, modern beekeeping is a mess as industrialized agriculture is. It is heading to a dead end. And as we are poisoning the soils and we're destroying the top soils of the earth with industrialized agriculture, which is, which is just, it's not really needed because we can just change to regenerative agriculture and we get more food out of the same uh, system than we do now. We don't use all these chemistry and we don't have to use all the pesticides and we can solve all these problems, even global warming. So um, the bees are certainly a part of it. So uh, bees, the, the bees biology is not serving the beekeeper or serving us humans being human beings as being kind of honey factories and boxes that we can manipulate and, you know, um, you know, subdue to our personal needs. But this is a species that has been long 
on the play, you know, on the face of Earth before humans even <laughs> developed. I mean, <laughs> you know, showed up on the face of Earth. So it is, it is a very old species, and uh, it has sustained all these millions of years. And now we as beekeepers think that we can change the genetics and to or make them better or improve them. To our, and what we're really doing is we are changing the genetic code, not by producing new genetics, but by, you know, taking out of the genetic pool the, um, the behavior that we choose that, that is, you know, good for us or benefit to us. And then we kind of try to compile that together and create a bee that is serving our needs. And it's not getting better in through the perspective of mother nature or the bees itself themselves so they are getting weaker and weaker and you know so they lose the abilities that are direly needed in order to survive independently in nature and uh, of course they then collect a lot of honey and they uh you know they do not sting anymore and so on and so forth which makes it convenient to exploit them but uh they are getting weaker and more and more dependent on medication and manipulation. And that is something that is just not right. It ultimately comes down to the fact that there's an inverse relationship between what we can benefit from them through that domestication process and their ability to survive without us. Right. Yeah. And if they need, if they can produce more for us, we have to put in more. So it's really, it's a zero sum game in a lot of ways, except we're creating a system of perpetual need from us. And then we're playing this uh, evolutionary arms race against nature, which is trying to kill it off because it's domesticated and it doesn't have those skills to exist outside in the world. Yeah, you, you got it. You know, you know, when it comes to honeybees, it's not so easy as it is with, uh, let's say, dogs. You can take a wolf and you can create dogs out of it because you're in control of uh, what semen and what XL or female you are choosing. But when it comes to honeybees, so the queen is flying out and is mating with like up to 20 drones. And so there is a, a huge genetic variety or diversity that almost every time kind of gets back to what is really needed for the bees themselves so if you really take your hands out and this is what is going on all the time i mean all the wild living bees and their drones are in the air as well and are at the mating places as well so there is a mixture of wild and domesticated bees but um to me as a scientific researcher when i look at my bees and i was a beekeeper before i did that research right so and i didn't know anything about bees which was really clear to me after i've started that research it is like it it would be an analogy like you know ask a fisherman about the natural behavior of deep sea crabs and he doesn't know he just knows how to catch them right yeah. yeah, but he knows nothing about their lives or their life circle or, you know, what they uh, what their behaviors are and what they, you know, why they're doing this. So he doesn't know anything. He just knows how to catch them. And that's like the beekeeper. He knows how to manipulate bees and get the most out of them and how to tackle the side effects of the husbandry system. This is what beekeeping is all about. But he doesn't know anything about the the natural wonders and behaviors that bees are able to show in natural con- in, in natural conditions. And this is very comparable to, um, I mean, how much we have lost track to uh, to the natural balance can be plainly seen if you do research on wild living bees. It is like uh, if if you really if if you do research on bees and boxes, is like doing research in an intensive farming house on animals and trying to figure out their natural behavior. This is something that is just impossible, right? Yeah. Or if you go into a zoo and you you just you do research on the natural behavior of elephants, then you would maybe come to the conclusion that they like to be fed with bananas from children and then you know go to <laughs> Africa and send your child with a banana to an elephant herd and you will be faced with another truth, right? So yeah. it is absurd. It is absolutely absurd to put a polar bear into the desert and you know then fight the symptoms of the side effects. These animal, 
does not belong in that place and bees do not belong in boxes on the ground not being manipulated by the beekeeper you know the brood is enhanced it's like you know tuning an engine this is what beekeepers do they enhance the brood field so that you have a lot of worker bees but when you increase the brood field and you have a mass of brood you automatically increase the varroa mice right and at the end when you decrease the amount of volume and the colony is getting smaller through you know when it comes to the winter time the oversized varroa mite population is still there so you need is use chemistry it's easy to understand it's, it's absolutely easy to understand that but um in beekeeping it's like you you know the the, the british people i don't know if you americans say that but there is a saying um they can't think out of the box <laughs> Yep. So the beekeepers, they can't think of the box because they are only looking inside their boxes and think that this is a reality. But what they are looking at is a broken and tortured animal subdued to the personal needs of the beekeeper. It's not nature. And it's not natural what the bees are doing in, in the boxes because their behavior shifts to a totally different behavior when they are allowed to live in normal conditions or in species appropriate conditions like in a tree cavity that has just 40 liters of volume not 200 and you know there is a limit to the intake that they can take in because the volume is limited so after they have kind of taken in their storage security which is their first and most distinctive instinct in order to survive or establish its survivability they will do anything that they have to to create a storage security and after that when you know the brood in the cavity is being pushed down by the intake then the bees will turn to behaviors like grooming each other biting off the mites um, you know cleaning themselves propolizing the inner walls which is the outer immune system of the colony and uh, so they are not flying out anymore very much they their lifespan is you know enhanced extremely and the the life circle like the queen stops laying eggs and you know or just very little there is there is not that huge overturn of life that you would see in a box because what we're doing in boxes is like first we put them on the ground which is a selective factor so the ground is killing beehives in the wilderness bees would never choose the ground to live in if they have another opportunity or if they have a cavity up in the tree they would choose that and that is because you know if it comes to evolution all the bee colonies that have populated tree cavities close to the ground they have been gone through the selectional phase and they have failed so because you have bacteria you have mold you have all the spores that are getting airborne and you know the whole the whole colony consists of organic material which these microbes want to consume so they are confronted with a lot of problems even with the climatic conditions more moisture and so on and so forth then they would face in a tree cavity far away from the ground and then we enhance the brood we you know kill the queens we enhance the volume we are just tuning the bees to our needs and then by doing that by adding empty boxes empty boxes empty boxes we are kind of putting the bees in a in a emergency situation where they think oh we have no storage security so the only thing that the bees are caring about is establishing the storage security which they can never achieve because the storage is always taken off and an empty box is being put on top yeah they wouldn't turn to the behavior uh like washboarding like grooming like probabilizing the inner walls and so they would automatically create uh because of the you know the, the the foraging bees they get worn out within a few days and they have an accelerated lifespan and they have you know more offspring that is being created and they have you know shorter life and so the overall overturn is much higher and so the voromite population is growing and this is you know this is all unhinged from natural conditions basically yeah. this is nothing that you would see in the tree cavity and a friend of mine jonathan power from the natural beekeeping trust in england once said if uh, a bee would never get into the honey business the price is way too high 
That's what he yeah. said. And, and he's right because yeah. it comes, it always, it is always based on the overturn of energy that goes through the hive. It doesn't even matter if you place bees in thin walled hives on a rooftop in the sunlight, in the wind, in the, you know, in, in the rain, in, in the weather conditions where you have very unstable conditions where the box is gaining or losing temperature as you would expect it in an uninsulated, you know, exposed position. I mean, you, do yourself a favor and as a, as a beekeeper and stand on a roof in the city on a sunny day and you will feel like, okay, oh gosh, it's going to get 60 degrees or whatever. And then after that, if you survive that, staying there all day, then go into a forest and see that the temperature drops like 25 or 30 degrees and it's very stable. So that is the natural surrounding of honeybees is the forest. So the forest has yeah. its own microclimate. Um, they are they are covered by the leaves, so there is no direct sunlight, no direct wind. There is no exposure to, you know, to the harsh weather conditions, and they are living in very stable climatic conditions in the forest. And you wouldn't see the heat peaks that you see on the day daily in the city. You know, it's it's very yeah, it's very linear the climatic conditions. And then you have the tree cavity itself, which is thick walled. You have the open fiber wood, which absorbs humidity. And when it comes to wood, um, wood is a very special material because it combines three very important physical features in one material. And that is, it is a good insulation. It has uh, a heat capacity. It can store heat and it can absorb and emit humidity. So all that combined creates a rock stable climate within the tree cavities and you can do some climatic measurements this is what i did like outside and inside the tree cavity without any you know heating component inside without a colony inside just you know the empty cavity and then you would see that the weather outside is changing it's like you know a heartbeat line and the the climatic conditions in the tree cavity are are rock stable and this is like a passive house. It's like, you know, you, you build a house that doesn't need any energy or whatever. So it is, this is what the bees were living in. And they need that linear climatic conditions in order to create or establish their brood temperature and hold it up to 60, uh, 36 degrees. And, you know, now think of them being in a box on a rooftop in the city they have to cool the house. They have to heat it up. They have, you know, they have these huge overturns. And if you look with a thermal camera and the whole boxes are, are kind of glooming, everything that you see there in colors is a waste of energy. And when it comes to our houses, this would be fossil fuel. If it comes to bees, that's nectar. And so, you know, a, a box like, uh, you know, a, a huge and modern, a modern box, with a volume up to like 150 or 200 liters has an overall overturn of nectar, which can exceed 1000 liters in one summer. If you look at a tree cavity or a colony in a tree cavity in the forest, it needs between 30 and 60 liters of nectar. That's all. Oh, wow. The footprint or the, the, what, you know, the, the, the exceeded overturn is like 20 times as much as a normal colony. And now think of, if you look at Seeley's work on wild living colonies in the Arnold Forest, which is really interesting because uh, the Arnold Forest is a huge forest and there's not much going on. There's not much civilization whatsoever. So you have the ecological balance with all the hundreds of other pollination insects or insects that are feeding on nectar. So are dependent on nectar and um, the density of honeybees in such surroundings in natural conditions was throughout 40 years of his research. He had just one bee colony in a tree cavity in one square kilometer. That's all. Now, if you just would, if, if you go into such a forest and you put one box into the middle of such a square kilometer, that'll mean it's like 20, you know, 20 tree colonies living in that square kilometer and then you of course you exceed the natural resources because all the nectar resources in that area are, are occupied by you know all the hundreds of other species and birds and beetles and hoverflies and butterflies and you know 
is all occupied. So that's, you know, that's the only food source for the most important creatures that we have that are keeping our ecosystems running. And we are very much depending on these creatures. And by saying that, we are now, due to modern beekeeping, we are now taking more nectar out than we have ever done before. This is just unprecedented. We have never taken that much nectar out of the system or the cultural landscape than we do today with, you know, based on modern beekeeping and compensation. And we can then you just ignore the natural balances, which was impossible for thousands of years in beekeeping because we had no industrialized sugar. We can place now, you know, in Germany, we have like cities like Berlin has 25 bee colonies per square kilometer in the city. And each of that, uh, you know, is is using up to 20 times as much nectar as a, you know, colony which would be living in natural conditions. So that is absolutely insane. If you convey this to the fishing industry, just in a, as an example, that'll mean, you know, you, you would have like, 25 fisher boats in one square kilometer of ocean. And so a bee colony normally forages in a circle of three kilometers. That means you have a circle of six kilometers in diameter, which is a surface of approximately 28 square kilometers. So in each of these 28 square kilometers, another 25 or 20 bee colonies would be there. If you sum this up, this means that every square meter in Berlin is being foraged by more than 500 bee colonies. And if you if you look at the fishing industry, that, that'll mean you would have like, if you would like to dive in the ocean, you would have to cut yourself through 500 fishing nets, you know, <laughs> in order to yeah. see the ocean. And they would there, they would be there from, from the early day on when the sun rises until, you know, the end of the day. So, and then that's beekeeping. So we are literally, yeah we are literally starving the other species to death because the amount of nectar in a certain location is always limited, right? You can calculate that. And we did this for Berlin for the very first time. And the the numbers are shocking. If you had the normal density, which would be natural, like the natural balance, like one bee colony in a tree cavity per square kilometer, that will mean that more than 99% of all the nectar production of all the plants in that field, in, in that area, more than 99% of the nectar resources would be left for the hundreds of other species, like the you know, beetles and you know the, the, the other wild bees and the butterflies and whip flies and whatever. If, you, if it comes to Berlin, we can calculate that up to 90% of all the nectar that is being produced is now ending up in, in beekeeping boxes. That is a catastrophe. And at the same time, the beekeeping lobby is kind of using the narrative to uh, kind of, yeah, it's it's disguising itself in 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 preservation. You know, they they pretend to do something good to nature, and they are kind of kidnapping all the idealistic people who really want to do good to to the bees and to nature, and they kind of drag them into the system of of industrialized agriculture and exploitation. Yeah. And we see that with like the term greenwashing is pretty common here. Right. Uh, I don't know if you guys have that same term, yeah. um, but just the idea of taking something and trying to paint it as being actually beneficial for the environment, you know, right. the, the Starbucks model of you buy this cup, cup of coffee and it's going to do all these great things, but it's still doing those bad things too. <laughs> uh, but we're not going to talk about that part. You're, you're paying $4 for this coffee. So, yeah, you know, it's doing good things. Yeah. And yeah, you have a lot of, you have a lot of these, uh, uh, industries or a lot of these brands are now financing beekeepers, ordinary beekeepers who are doing modern beekeeping in cities on rooftops. And then they, they, they are getting the honey and then they, they just take that honey and give it away to their customers as a kind of present. People would, I mean, if, if they would understand that a glass of honey is nothing but a glass full of species extinction, because this is what it is. It's not our food, right? All the flowers, the whole evolution has never had us as the major consumer of nectar on its, you know, on its radar. Yeah. This is the only 
food source for all these species and creatures that are literally carrying the ecosystems on their wings and we are part of these ecosystems. doesn't make any sense for us to rob them their only food source and drive them into extinction. And for, for a substance like honey, which is not even needed for, for us, we don't need this. No one is going to die if we don't eat any honey. But we are certainly going to die if we wipe out all these species relevant species, you know, all of these system relevant species, say, sorry. Yeah. And so that is that is what I'm fighting for, to let that people really get an idea of that, you know, nectar is limited. And in my presentations, I always show a bottle of water, just as an example, because you can really kind of see what's going on. And I say, just imagine that this bottle of water full of nectar is is the amount of nectar that is grown in that city where I'm doing the presentation. So how can an unlimited number of people who want to have their share out of this bottle can be right, can be just, can be sustainable? And it's not. I mean, every child can understand this, you know? Yeah, but still, they would ignore this and and try to argue that the amount that they take out of nature is is not a big deal. But if you if it comes to numbers, that's hilarious. It's it's a statement that is that's far away from the truth. Thanks for tuning in to the Poor Pearls Almanac. We've been exploring new areas of content, including new podcasts such as Tomorrow Today and the Gastropocene with yours truly, but also building a network with folks like Death and Friends. We're also building gardening resources and have a bunch of other content coming in the future. If you'd like to get more information or to sign up for our newsletter where we announce new projects, head over to poorproles.com and click on the Our Email List tab. The email list is only used for important newsworthy content and we won't clog your inbox and you'll get less than six emails a year. That's poorproles.com at the Our Email List tab. Now, you brought up the fact that the honeybee populations are much more, first off, they're much more efficient in the woods for a number of reasons because of the way they're living. But one of the things you've inferred is that the populations are much smaller. So like with a typical like Langstroth hive, the number I usually see is between 40 and 75,000 bees live in a Langstroth hive at its peak, right? So how many bees are living in like one of these wild populations? <laughs> Well, you know, I've never counted them. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> no, no. But um you can think of, you know, if if you have a if you have a hive that reaches up to I mean, an ordinary hive has like two boxes full of brood. That's just just the brood field and you add another two boxes or three boxes for the for the for the harvest. So um a single box would be the perfect size for a tree cavity, so about 40 liters. And that's all. And everything is in that 40 liters. So the whole brood field, the whole intake, everything is working in these 40 liters. And there is no enhancing of volume. There is no, you know, the, no such thing. So the amount of bees is certainly not different because everything that has been wasted in, in form of heat loss and nectar or because of the exposure on rooftops and once, you know, or you take out the harvest or whatsoever, all the loss is in natural condition is, is conveyed into physical bees and then they swarm. Yeah. And out of one colony, uh, which is living in a tree cavity of 40 liters, you will see that two or three swarms will go out. So from one colony, you have the oscillation throughout the year of uh, its reproduction phase, where one colony creates the two swarms or three swarms of offspring. Then you have like three or four bee colonies in one square kilometer living there. And then the selectional phase will just adapt the bees and kill everyone or every colony that has not the ability to survive in that location and uh, there is no one who is using medication or substitute anything that the bees cannot do so that's why they are adapted really so that oscillation means that all the observations from the beekeepers when they see a tree cavity and they say oh it survived only one year that was dead is just silly because it's not about the individual colony it is about the population right and this is something that i had to learn because i'm doing a monitoring on like 150 wild colonies and i've set up some rewilding projects in germany 
And, you know, I started here around my house. I'm living in the forest. I started like, like with 15 colonies, right? Way too much for one square kilometer. So if it comes to normal densities with one colony per square kilometer. So I had like 15 artificial tree cavities. So these are tree cavities of the, the hives that I've built, the, the shiffer trees. They are simulating the physical effects of, of natural tree cavities. That's what, what they do. So we have hung them all up. And then we had the selectional phase. And uh, now in the third year of that project, we only had one colony left. And then the swarms of the forest came back this year. Now we have four colonies living in that area. So you see, we are now in the fourth year of that project. And we have four thriving colonies being left. They have never been fed. They have never been treated with anything. And they are well. So that is how nature works. Right? Within a few years, they have just adapted. All the bees who were not able to set up the combs properly, who were not able to, uh, you know, get the storage in, or you know, had other problems or genetic failures, they have died out within the first winter time. So because only the bees, you know, mother nature is just it doesn't have any emotions, doesn't compensate anything. So it just, you know, just kills every colony that has not the abilities. So what we see now is that these bees are very well adapted. And we had a lot of comp building failures at the end, uh, at, at the beginning when we started. So like 75% of the colonies were not able to set up their comps freely without any back sheets in frames. And uh, all these colonies have died in the first year. So we've lost 75% within the first year. Now, all the swarms that have come back from the forest this year not a single one has had that comp building failure. Yeah. So you see, the system is cleaning itself if you just keep your hands out. And that a single colony is dying in a tree cavity that you are observing doesn't mean a thing because the queen, which is in that in that cavity throughout the summertime or the, the early time of the summer, is not the same queen at the end of the summer, right? Because it's going to swarm. And we had another project which really made it clear we had a school project and we hung up some empty tree cavities and a swarm moved into one of them. The next year, that swarm, or that colony, this queen from 2019, she, she moved in into another tree on the schoolyard. And then, you know, the new queen failed. So that, you know, that tree cavity was empty, but it was still the old queen. And the next year it swarmed back into the old one. And you know, the the the, <laughs> the colony that has been left in, in the new tree tree has been failing as well. So it was still the same queen. It was three years old, but the colony, you know, it was just another location where she was in. Yeah. Now, as a beekeeper who cannot think out of the box and is observing a tree cavity which is failing and which is empty at the, you know, in the springtime, which is very likely doesn't mean a thing doesn't mean that the population has been failing it does just mean that evolution is working and that natural selection is working and there is no need for any intervention because if you interfere you're killing evolution right and if you just keep your hands out the system still works great and it's it's everywhere the same people ne really need to understand that they love the bees to death by compensating by using that medication by you know compensating the genetic failures or even creating these genetic failures themselves by, you know, by breeding or even simply by keeping bees in boxes. We are, we are causing genetic corrosion, which is unclear to most of the beekeepers because, you know, if a bee colony in a box survives, doesn't mean it can survive in a tree cavity. And the best example is that, you know, the rewilding project that we have been doing and that most of the bee colonies were unable to set up their wild combs in it without any wax sheets. So if you have them in boxes, they wouldn't die, right? In a tree cavity, they would be dead because they would lose their temperature regulations due to the building of the combs or the comb structure. So they have a certain uh, radiation system and they have to attach the combs to the top of the cavity. And then you have these pockets that are being created by the combs and the warm air is kind of staying in these pockets, heating up the whole storage. And it's, it's working like a radiation system. When the temperature drops, the whole storage is still warm and, you know, 
and heating or it has that heat capacity and the bees they only need to heat up a little bit to compensate the the temperature loss from the outside and the climatic conditions will be stable so if they are unable to build that comes in the top and they start at the bottom and you know reach like one third or just leave an empty space at the top they'll be dead so they'll be failing in surviving and uh, in a box you would never see this so you would we we breed from these bees probably so you will increase the genetic corrosion on the species itself just by keeping them in boxes but yeah. you know and there are 20 more examples that i could point out we have like a lot of selectional factors that we could identify in natural tree cavities that are not there in boxes so if if a polar bear learns how to survive in the zoo doesn't mean he can survive in in his natural you know surrounding in the antarctic antarctica yeah it's it's a totally different story yeah so you've brought up a i think an interesting point in the sense that like the way we're raising bees today doesn't make any sense so if i'm someone that does want you know i'm passionate about honeybees i enjoy doing it but I don't want to be causing, you know, ecological destruction or destroying the honeybee populations. What are the the things I should be doing to ethically, and I, I'll use that term a little bit loosely here, keep bees? I, I would say not keep bees because bees don't <laughs> need to be kept. You know, bees need sure. a place to thrive and to be allowed to unfold their genetic architecture so that they can fully unfold their abilities and live in natural conditions. So the best thing that you can do is, this is what we are doing now. It had been a long time common before I was able to free my bees fully from any interventions from my side. Before I was able to do this, I had to free myself from everything that I had learned in beekeeping, literally. What I do now is I just hang up these empty tree cavities because what we have been doing throughout the last century, especially because of the First and Second World War, especially in Germany and Europe, we have conveyed all the ancient trees. We have chopped them down. We have, you know, cut the ancient trees down, and all the trees that we have here, they are not. They are just seventy years old or something. So it's it's very young trees, and you don't have that huge. Uh, normally, you don't have a huge amount of these huge um, of 40 liters tree cavities. Of course, you have the wood picker, packer um, uh, cavities, but they are way too small. Now, it needs a few more decades that these uh, tree cavities are increasing in volume due to bats moving in and hanging up to the top and, you know, and just, you know, um, broke loose a little bit of the wood and, you know, the, the moldering part of the, the cavities. And so they, they increase in volume throughout century, you know, so decades. And, um, we have wiped out that natural habitat of species appropriate cavities. And that is why I have reconstructed physically the, the tree cavities and I've just rebuilt natural tree cavities and uh, then i did the measurements and i could tell yeah, okay we have the same stable conditions here that we would see in natural tree cavities so we hung them up in certain locations certain forests and um, about one third of all the cavities that we hang out are being occupied within the first year of wild you know of wild swarms of course they escape out of boxes but it doesn't matter because by the time they move in these tree cavities, they free themselves of any legal obligations here in Germany because they have moved in freely. And because I didn't, I didn't kind of take them into, um, into my, uh, property by catching them, you know, I, I'm not claiming any interest on these bees, so I'm not catching them and putting them in, but I just let them go and they move in freely. So I'm not a beekeeper. It's, it's the same system like a bird's house. You just hang up bird's houses and you see the birds are moving. And so you're doing the best thing that you can do to birds uh, by giving them shelter and giving them the species appropriate habitat that they have lost due to our deforestation. And then the whole system starts working again. So what we're doing is we are setting up structures that a wilderness can develop again. 
And this is working out really well. And the good thing is, when I started that, I said goodbye to honey 100%. I said, you know, I don't need this anymore. I'm, I'm not going to eat any honey anymore. And now, you know, I tell you what, my cupboard is full of honey. And you know why, why this is? Because of the oscillation of offspring and selection. So what is, you always have one colony is setting up two swarms, then the natural selection comes and you have one colony left or two, or there's always one colony or two that are being, yeah, that, that are dying throughout the winter time. <clears throat> and the good thing is the comms and the storage, they are not starting to decompose as they would do in boxes on the ground. But, you know, even months after the, the colony has died or flown out, they look as if the colony has just left. They look like brand new. There's no mold whatsoever. And then we can take out that honey. And we took it out not because we were interested in honey, but we were just interested what what happened to the bees. Did they starve or whatever? So we brought them down, put them in the laboratory. Then we opened them and we did our kind of autopsy on all this colony, all these colonies. And then we had all of a sudden, we had, okay, there's five kilos of honey okay, what, what are we going to do with it? Okay, just press it out, you know? So, and, and then we did. And the amazing thing about that is that that honey is way more antibiotic than the honey that we know in the now modern beekeeping system. So it's like, it's it's even a, a huge, you know, um, it's, oh. it's, it's a competition for, how is that Manuka honey? You know, mm -hmm. you know, Manuka honey, we're shipping that around the world and you pay like $200 a euros for one kilo of Manuka honey because it's so antibiotic. And the reason why, you know, natural honey is so antibiotic is that that is not, that is unproven until now, which is, this is my idea why this is. It's because, you know, the whole cavity is propolized, right? And propolis is a very good antibiotic material. So there, are, there is scientific research that tells you that if you take bees out of a box and put them into a box which is propolized, within a few days you can prove that they have much less bacteria on the bodies, in the bodies, and the immune system stops working on that high level, they, because they are not infected, not fighting these and you know these bacteria or these pathogens. So this is like our skin; it's like an outer immune system. And then you have the therapy for people who have problems with their with their lungs or whatever. So asthma, it's called asthma. I don't know mm -hmm. if, if that's the word yep. that you're using. Yeah, so they breathe the air of colonies from boxes, right? So and it helps them with their with the lung and with the you know with the inflammation. That's because we have that propolis and the propolis has antibiotic features, and you can smell propolis. And the reason why you smell it is because Fresh propolis it has a lot of ingredients and they are evaporating into the atmosphere. So now think of uh, a box which is barely propolized because it has smooth walls and bees only propolize open fiber wood. So um, a tree cavity is fully covered in propolis and you have these antibiotic features. And then all the antibiotic ingredients are getting into the atmosphere of the tree cavity. And the air is soaked with that ingredients. And we can prove, we could prove in scientific research when we did some wipe tests of mold and whatsoever, you put these mold tests into that atmosphere and they were sterilized by the atmosphere. So everything that this atmosphere is touching is being sterilized. And that is, that is a miracle. Even the humidity that the bees are creating by digesting honey in the winter time. So uh, you have 20% of honey is water. And then you're in the sugar molecules itself, there's a lot of water, which when it is digested in the body of the bees gets free. So in one kilo of honey is about 700 milliliters of water, which is a side product of digesting honey. It's like warm energy, it's uh, CO2 and it's, uh, it's water. And that water is then condensating underneath the storage comes on the walls on the propolis and then it mineralizes itself with the ingredients of the propolis and the bees are going down and recollect that water and feeding the brood with it in the springtime and if you take samples of that water you can prove that this water is in antibiotic so they are drinking their own 
antibiotic water and they have their own water cycle inside the cavity, their own water supply, when it comes to boxes on the ground, that, that water in the corners is automatically causing mold, right? So mold is spreading on the combs and the bees get infected. And if you dissect these bees, you can see that all their intestines are infected with this uh, with the with the mold and they are literally ill so um you know these antibiotic atmosphere is called nestdurchwärmebindung it's a term it's a german word which you cannot really translate but it, which means that the air is soaked with these antibiotic ingredients of the propolis so then you have the concentration gradient right so these substances are not stopping by the honey right so they will kind of get into the honey throughout the time that the honey is being in that cavity. So it's like a good wine in a barrel. The longer it stays in the barrel, <laughs> the better it tastes. Um, the longer the honey stays in a tree cavity, which is propolized and which has that, you know, antibiotic conditions, the more antibiotic the honey gets. So at the end, you get out only five kilos of honey but you can sell each of these kilos for up to 200 euros. So that means that five kilos of honey are worth like 1,000 euros. And if you want to achieve that due to ordinary beekeeping, that would mean you would have to get about 100 liters of honey out of that colony in order to sell it for 10 euros per, per kilo in order to get the same amount of money. And you ha you're busy throughout the whole summer time. You have to, you know... Yeah. Uh, manipulate and, and interfere all the time with the bees, uh, which has nothing to do with preservation. And the good thing, again, is that the honey that we are taking out is in balance with the natural resources. So it's sustainable. It's much more antibiotic. And when it comes to the future of beekeeping and honey itself, honey is not a mass product, right? It has never been a mass product. If it comes to medieval times, if you were just a farmer and you were feeding on honey, they would burn you. They would just kill you. It, it was it was for for the kings and queens, you know. That that was, you know, the the beekeepers of the medieval times. They were privileged people. They were allowed to carry weapons, and they were kind of superior to the ordinary people. And so it was never it was a mass product. Now we are eight billion people on this planet. How <laughs> we cannot meet the demands of the public of honey. Even today, about twenty five percent on the of the honey. Uh, in the market is not really honey. It's just, you know, sugar, water, or syrup or whatever. So yeah. uh, if we cannot do this because it's unsustainable, then we should stop this, right? And the future of honey or beekeeping is not uh, mass production, but is the production of class by preservation. You know, you can do preservation. And as a reward, because of the engine of evolution, which is selection, you always get a certain amount of honey, which is then automatically filling your storage for your own personal need. And that's a high medical, it's it's a medical product. It's not something that you would use finger thick on your toes in the morning. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there is a way to be in balance with sustainability, with preservation, with helping the bees, with the natural resources, and literally meet the demands of the majority of all the beekeepers out there who are starting beekeeping because they are idealistic people. Most of them are starting beekeeping because they want to do good to nature and bees, not because they want to get into the honey business. And then yeah. they automatically are dragged into the honey business. And then they are kind of, you know, they, they, they get... They, they get into the system where they need to pay a lot of money for all the tools they need every year, for the medication, for the sugar, for the glasses, for the, you know, for all the tools that you need. And then, of course, the bees need to repay this because this is, <laughs> this is expensive, right? And then you are yeah. in the system. You are a payer for the honey lobby, right? This is what they're yeah. doing with you. They are kind of disclosing the system or they, they're trying to guiding the system as something good to nature and bees and then they are kind of taking your money and you know and the whole thing is a mess for the whole environment 
I got to imagine that the bees, as you're bringing them up, the difference in the, the honey quality also, uh, you know, the bees are healthier and then the systemic impacts that has on the, ec the ecologies where they live, right? You know, the, the birds that are eating those bees or whatever it might be, that's uh, how those bees are going back into that ecosystem are providing a better health benefit than sickly bee that's hopped up on chemicals, you know? Uh, and, and that's really important too. Yeah, th that's that's a good point. But, you know, taking that point into, into account, you really have to think of, when it comes to Germany, just an example, because I know the numbers here in Germany, um, we have a million bee colonies being kept in boxes, right? So it's a million. And that means these million boxes are now using the amount of nectar of about 1 million tons every summer, every summer. So it could be like only 150,000 to 300,000 kilos of nectar when they were living in natural conditions. And then of course you would have to wipe out the exaggerated density of bees because this is highly unnatural. We cannot keep like 25 bee colonies in a square kilometer in a city. That's insane. So if you, if you clear the system, think of that amount of nectar that we take out of the system. It's a million tons. And now think of how many hundred thousands of tons of wild bees, butterflies, flies would be created or would develop on that nectar if it would stay where it belongs. And then imagine of all the birds, of of all the predatory birds, of the bats, of you know, of the hornets, of you know, it's 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 the whole network of species that is affected by the fact that we are taking a primary primarily food source, which is which has no substitute out of the system and using that in such an amount for us as a luxury product which no one really needs. Yeah. It is horrific. And the hype of beekeeping is ongoing. So then the number of bee colonies within the cities is increasing in numbers that are that are unbelievable at the moment. So people really need education on that matter. It all comes back to the bottle, right? That I show in my presentations. How can yeah. an unlimited number of people Getting their share of nectar can be right if the nectar is limited. So, and if the if it belongs to these species that have been on the face of Earth long time before we showed up. Torben, this has been a really eye-opening conversation. <laughs> um, I, I've learned quite a bit. For folks that want to, I guess, see some more of the work you're doing or are interested in learning more from you, where can they hear from you? Are you on social media, YouTube? I know we had talked a little bit about something else you've got going on. Not sure if you can talk about that quite yet, but yeah, please tell us. Well, I, <laughs> to be honest, I have done a lot of in, in German, but I haven't translated that into English until now. But um, what I did... Yeah, a lot of, of my research is in the book, What Bees Want, which has been published this year in America, uh, What Bees Want. And I have written an article which is named The True Price of Honey. And we are working on an international documentary on that matter. So uh, with the same name, I will send you that article if, if you like, and uh, you can share that as you want or as you wish so that people can connect with you or just send me an email and I will send them a copy of uh, the article, The True Price of Honey, which is a good summary of what I've been talking about. But this is all with the, you know, with the sources and uh, yeah, with, uh, with the numbers and, you know, it's, it's all in that article. Basically, I've written a book, which is called Evolution of Beekeeping, but it is only available in German at the moment. But, you know, maybe you have some German <laughs> listeners who are interested in reading that book. Maybe there is someone who has some contacts who would like to translate the book and, you know, just sell it in America or whatever. So just contact me. Yeah. Awesome. And you definitely have some content up on YouTube. Uh, can you reiterate what's the documentary called? Uh, the documentary that we are working on is the true price of honey. Yeah. True price of honey. Awesome. You know, it's, it's in the first footsteps now, but we have been created trailer right now, which will be published soon. And, um, 
yeah, we are working on that international documentary because we feel like it's not another book is going to change the world because you know before we get to solve our ecological problems, we need to solve the educational problems, right? Because these yeah. people out there, they are not, you know, they 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 are idealistic people. They really want to do good to bees. They really want to do good to nature. And they are kind of betrayed by the beekeeping lobby and brought into a system which is doing great harm to not yeah. only to the bees and to the species of the bees, but also to the to the life of the future generations. Yeah, all uh, all ecological problems really are social problems in our relationship with that ecology. Right. Yeah. So if it's all about education, that doesn't mean that we are incapable of of eating honey, but we can, as I told you, we can have that honey out of preservation, which is in balance with the whole system, and which is a beautiful thing. So, and you, yeah. I always allow me the last sentence. You know, I always tell the beekeepers when I'm talking to people thing. So, and you, yeah. I always allow me the last sentence. You know, I always tell the beekeepers when I'm talking to beekeepers. I tell them, you know, believe it or not, but you could go on vacation, guys. <laughs> you don't have to yeah. do anything just set up these tree cavities and be happy when the bees move in and when they die out that's it i mean it's it's your opportunity to get your share and that's it you can't do more than this if, if it comes to preservation yeah be thoughtful i think that's that's what we need right torben thanks so much this has been fantastic thank you very much yeah.